I V M. Hey, welcome to Shunya One, episode eighty-seven. Today we have a very interesting guest with us, and we're going to talk about something which is distinctively new in tech. It's uh, a new piece of thing, right? I mean, like it's something that is kind of getting hot right now. But I think it's a uh, also like you know, I mean, it's a it's a very important thing. I think as well from a couple yes, of different it's, perspectives. It's a little departure from our usual sort of food tech shows, f- <laughs> tech shows, <laughs> or even app shows, yeah. or. Coding shows here. It's uh, it involves some very interesting things. We'll, yeah. uh, it'll be. I look forward to it. Yes. But talking about our last week's episode, I think it was a fun episode. It was really. Together. It was really fun. I mean, like I don't know if I mentioned it at that time, but I mean, like I felt like I actually learned a lot from Viral. Oh yes, episode. photon to photon, photon time. Photon to photon time. No, and also I mean, like you know, when you're talking about like you know how they look at algorithms and how they're looking at different things that are worth putting money behind in terms of video content and stuff like that, I thought that that was very applicable to what we do over here in the podcasting space. So yep. I thought it was kind of very useful from that perspective. Yep, it's a whole interesting new genre of media consumption. Yes, on is. your phone <laughs> and uh, I'm sure we'll definitely be talking about it a lot more also mm-hmm. yep, on the yep. show but coming back to our guest for today we're talking to Varun Deshpande who's the managing director of India of the Good Food Institute and they are an organization which really helps build a whole new sector which is setting up in our country and there's a lot of interesting things uh, we'll be talking about so let's yep. get on with our show All right, welcome to our brand new episode 87 of Shuni One. Welcome to the show, Varun. How's it going? It's going really well. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. We are here, of course, to talk about the Good Food Institute and the work you're doing here in India. And as I was introducing this, I realized that I don't know whether I should call you agency or a group or a... Uh, I would say... Advocacy, like, right? Is that it? Are you guys, is your organization an advocacy organization? Yeah. Why don't you give us a little background about exactly what the organization stands for? And of course, you and the role the team here is playing. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So we are a global nonprofit. You can think of us as sector builders or coalition builders, which builds the entire sector of plant-based and cell-based meat, eggs and dairy. And the reason why we do this is because uh, industrial animal agriculture, which is the way that the world currently gets its meat, Uh, is essentially a broken system, Mm. right? So we're growing all these crops to feed all these animals and then getting a small proportion of those animals back out as meat. Companies all over the world have realized that this is a problem for various reasons, Mm. for food security reasons, for environmental reasons, for reasons of public health, uh, reasons of um, antimicrobial resistance. There are a lot of reasons why people would want to get involved in this sector. Mm -hmm. And the entrepreneurs with whom we work are really making a huge change in the food system. We also work with corporations, we work with governments, uh, we work with scientists, we work with pretty much anyone who can affect the global supply of meat and protein. Wow. And it's a, it's a very strong sector to sort of, I mean, very broad, of course, but as a focus of your organization, right, you're actually trying to play a role in all parts of this supply chain, which you just mentioned, working with actual startups who are trying to innovate in this sector, right? So what... Where does the role today, where do, where does India stand in this whole understanding of this sector in the first place? Because it's actually something, while many of us would have heard about it, and maybe we've been hearing small research papers or there's a article on the internet somewhere that something's been innovated. But as a commercial product, it's still on the fringes. So how do you go about actually uh, setting this up? So this is a great question. I would actually want to answer this question by zooming out a little bit and talking about the history of this sector, right? Back in 2009, there were a couple of entrepreneurs in the US who decided they want to bring all of their expertise from biology, from renewable energy into remaking meat. And they realized that, you know, in meat, Uh, you have a few things. You have amino acids, you have minerals, you have water. Mm. And all of those things can be got from plants. So you don't really need to be growing all these plants, feeding it to animals, and then slaughtering those animals for food. So these two entrepreneurs, Pat Brown and Ethan Brown, no relation, they started two different companies, Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods. And uh, they did really well. They were making burgers that were completely removed from the previous generation of uh, meat substitutes or veggie burgers. And um, fast forward a few years later, uh, a group of people coming from animal welfare, from environmentalism, realize that if we want to target this problem in the food system, this is a really promising way 
of doing it. Can you expand a little bit on the problem itself, right? Because I mean, like we've spoken about that a little bit offline, but some of the stuff that you were telling me about, like just in terms of calorie in versus calorie out kind of was astounding to me. Yeah, absolutely. I, You know, chicken, which is the most efficient industrial farmed meat, uh, it takes in nine calories of input to give you one calorie of output in the form of flesh. Right. And, you know, fish is about the same. Pigs are way worse. Cows are way, way worse. So if we're talking about, you know, especially in a country like India, it would be really unconscionable to build up this system as consumers demand more meat and more protein. Mm -hmm. You could find that producing that meat is competing against those same consumers for calories. Right. Wow. You also have a lot of these issues associated with the factory farming system on the environmental end. So you need to grow all these crops, transport these crops, you know, raise the chickens, transport the chickens, slaughter them. And all of that just means nine times more inputs in the form of gas, nine times more inputs in the form of fertilizer. All of these things contributing to environmental outcomes later on. Right. This is why the UN says that pretty much every environmental issue you can think of, whether it's uh, biodiversity, whether it's greenhouse gases, this particular industry, the industrial animal industry, is one of the worst there is. In fact, this industry contributes more to climate change than all emissions from transportation combined. Wow. So, yeah, so f- from an environmental standpoint, it's just a no-brainer right. to be looking at alternatives to this. And the way that we're going to make sure that these alternatives actually succeed, just as those entrepreneurs Pat Brown and Ethan Brown did, is to look at giving consumers what they want. So they don't have to think about the questions of morality or think about the questions of whether it's better for the environment, right? Right. You have to give consumers what they want on the basis of things that matter to them. And that's only fair. We have to meet people where they are, so to speak. So, (laughs) yes, uh, fantastic. So we have to meet people where they are and give them what they want on the basis of price, taste, convenience. You know, some people care about health, but overwhelmingly it's these three things. Price, taste, and convenience. If you give people authentic, tasty, uh, even nutritious, widely available alternatives that taste exactly the same, yeah. they will switch. Yeah, right. I, and that's, absolutely, I would. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So that that's what's been happening globally. The question was about India, right? Right. In India, this is something of a longer game, right? I think, and this is why I was hired at the Good Food Institute, that we can embed into the Indian food system in a way that means we completely leapfrog industrial animal agriculture. Now, as much as it is becoming more and more factory farming in India, so you have a lot of poultry, you have a lot of eggs, uh, we are still one of the lowest meat consuming countries in the world exactly. on a per yeah. capita basis, yeah. right? However, if you look at growth trends over the next decades, India, sub-Saharan Africa, and yes, China, these, these regions are going to contribute the most when it yeah. comes to growing meat demand. Yeah. From a sheer population perspective, if nothing else. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yes. Just from a sheer population perspective, we can scarcely afford all the attendant consequences of something like that happening, yeah. right? So when it comes to meeting our climate goals, India has actually taken a fairly leading role in terms of what it has pledged to do when mm-hmm. it comes to meeting the Paris Agreement, when it comes to meeting the Sustainable Development Goals. So if we want to continue on that path and meet those goals, we cannot afford to build up an, uh, an industrial animal agriculture system to supply all the meat to fulfill all the demand of all these consumers. So we have to find alternatives, not just for consumers, for the producers themselves. Mm-hmm. That's what we're hoping to do with this, uh, with these products that are essentially the same, but they satisfy all these needs without all of these negative externalities. Wow. I, I mean, I want to take a understanding of also how this comes about. You mentioned that you know, I've actually heard of Impossible Foods. I think they're... Uh, they're the gourmet burger people. Yeah, right? they've been widely popular, again, in circles which uh, understand this, right? Understand the business overall and the product overall. Uh, but as a part of your job and the organization's efforts, what are you seeing that we have to do unique? Apart from policy and process, like you also work with startups. You work with uh, teams which are trying to innovate using you know what is at hand what is the most innovative thing which has happened in the recent in recent times like impossible foods was how many years ago you said two decades ago almost oh it was 2009 so it's yeah. 10 years, than, it's ten years. years. yeah it's 10, 10 years, years. Yep. so then what was what has happened since then which has not made it like already replace everything else Yeah, that's a great question. So there's a ton of food innovation that's happening in this area, right? I think what's going to happen in India is it's going to take a different path and a different product and different categories of products entirely than it has taken in the West. Mm -hmm. The reason that Impossible and Beyond chose burgers to be the centerpiece of their strategy, and they did other things, by the way, they do sausage, they do uh, Beyond Meat just released, uh, just 
ground beef. Yeah. They do a lot of different things. The reason that the burgers are the hero category in the West is because Americans are eating three burgers a week. Right. Yeah. Which I mean, I love America, but that just sounds insane to me for various <laughs> reasons, right? Like for for the reasons that we outlined earlier, but also for human health. I mean, yeah. if we're talking about things like obesity, things like hypertension. That's just not a good decision. Right. So. Ethan Brown and Pat Brown said, look, we're, we're going to try and replace, if, even if we do one burger a week that gets replaced with a Beyond Meat product, mm-hmm. they just did a, what's known as a life cycle analysis mm-hmm. with the University of Michigan. If you replace that one burger out of three per week with a Beyond Meat burger, it would be the equivalent of taking 12 million cars off the road. Wow. Powering okay. 2.3 million additional homes. Right. So that, that's why they wanted to do what they're doing. And right. they brought all of that translational expertise from all these other areas and their passion mm-hmm. and they applied it to solving these problems in the world, right? Mm-hmm. Now back to India, I think in India it's not going to be burgers and that's what excites me about this, right? We are yet to see the innovation story in India and we're on the cusp of it. Right. It could be keema, it could be biryani. You know, I, I saw recently that Swiggy is doing one biryani every 3.5 minutes in yeah. India, right? Can we create food innovation from large companies and from entrepreneurs? that creates these new categories of mm. of uh, of plant based meats in india i think that that would be really exciting so what's the uh, well, you guys focus primarily on plant uh, just to kind of jump on what you're saying do you focus on plant based meat or is lab grown meat also part of that we also do cell based meat that's right and okay. the, the reason why we don't call it lab grown meat by the way is because okay. <laughs> you know i mean when you move beyond very small scales it right. wouldn't be lab grown anymore right, it would right. be set up in a clean manufacturing facility so yep. You know, cell-based meat is the other category of food mm. with which we work. Mm-hmm. And we think that both of these, if you take plant-based meat plus cell-based meat, uh, at some point, maybe the year 2050, mm-hmm. it'll form most of the meat that's eaten in the world. What's the difference actually, like, what, just to understand both cell and plant-based? So cell-based meat is meat that's grown using tissue engineering. So you essentially just take some cells from a chicken and then you grow a chicken. That's what ah, it is. So it's cloning. It's uh, semi-cloning. Uh, it's not. It's not cloning. It's just. It's just growing cells. It's just growing cells. Well, so, are you, you growing? so it's original. It's essentially still the original meat in its meat form. That's right. Versus yeah. plant based, which is a, which has no relation, it's apart a, from the taste and texture and. Yeah, that's right. So for plant based meat, the best way I think about it is that it's just switching the source of protein from mm-hmm. animals to plants. Mm-hmm. For cell based meat, it's biologically identical meat. So it is, uh, you know, it's meat just made without, you know, antibiotics, In, yeah. without the waste. You are taking cells from a chicken. Right. The chicken can run away and play after that. And uh, then you, you know, use those cells, grow them. Uh, in the same way that, you know, a lot of our medicine is made uh, using techniques of biotechnology. It's right. just applying biotechnology to this area and then growing them in a manufacturing facility. And then you can scale that up to provide good, affordable protein at scale is the vision. That's the future. How's it been so far? I mean, that's what I want to know. Like today, if I were to try either of these products made by any of these organizations and teams, what is it like? What's the adoption like? What does it actually translate to? Uh, you know, does, is it successful in the mass market already? Plant-based meat in the US, I'm going to say, because yeah. um, the sector is new and small in India. Of Plant-based course. meat in the US has been growing. Last year, it grew at 23%. And to give you some context, the entire food industry grew at 2%. Right. right? So it's a small category that's growing extremely fast. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you look at the way it's currently growing, it will actually hit that number that I said by 2050. Mm-hmm. We think that all of it will be or most of meat will be consumed in this way. Wow. Uh, it'll actually hit that number if it continues growing at this rate, right? Beyond Meat, which went public on the New York Stock Exchange in December, I believe, their S1 filing says that most of their consumers are meat eaters. They're not vegetarians. This is meat, <coughs> this is meat for meat eaters, right? Mm. You mentioned earlier that the Impossible Burger is a, a gourmet burger. Right. They transcended beyond that very, very quickly. So okay. they, they went from you know being served at Davos and being served at Michelin-starred restaurants to literally being served at White Castle from Harold and Harold okay. Kumar go to White Castle. <laughs> so they're doing, you know, a $30 Michelin star burger. They're also doing... The $3 in, White three Castle. Dollar, exactly. Impossible Sliders, <laughs> which is really cool. And also, Impossible Foods 2.0 burger, mm-hmm. right? So they're behaving like tech companies and launching <laughs> yeah, Impossible Burger 2.0. They exhibited or they served at the Consumer Electronics Show. Oh, CES? Yeah, yeah, they did. This year, they won Best of the Best. They won three awards including the overall best of the best award for the entire show. So all of these phones and laptops, apparently this burger is the hottest technology of 2019. And Impossible Meats is uh, cell-based, right? It's not plant-based. Impossible Foods is plant-based. It's plant-based, now, okay. So coming to cell-based, all right, there are 25 
plus companies all over the world mm-hmm. that are making cell based chicken, cell based beef, cell based fish, cell based pork, shrimp. They are yet to come to market. Okay. Currently, the US and Singapore and countries like them are debating a regulatory framework for this stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are really optimistic that this is going to come to market sometime in 2019 in some markets. Okay. Uh, and, you know, as competition goes up and as money gets pumped into research, we expect the cost to drop down very quickly as well. Right. So it's more about being at the research stage right now and plant based being already out there. Yeah, you're right. So that's why we exist, right? So we think that some of the highest impact work in this area is going to happen in research. So we continue to engage with governments, work with them to understand what might be the highest impact things that you can do in this area in terms of investment. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we think, look, if you compare this to renewable energy, which is a sector that's received a ton of investment and rightly so, we should be comparing ourselves in terms of research dollars and research rupees to that. Yeah. So if we're talking $30 billion dollars, in renewable energy, and I don't know if that's the number, then we should be talking $30 billion for this as well, Hmm. right? What we do is we work with scientific institutes, work with universities, help them understand what might be some topics they can investigate, work with governments to invest in these areas. So we're doing a really big project in Mumbai with the Institute of Chemical Technology, which is a great research university, ICT Mumbai, used to be called UDCT. UDCT, yeah. Yeah, we believe that they can help, they can be pivotal actually to helping to scale up cell-based meat. So we're doing a research center with them. Mm-hmm. It's called Center of Excellence in Cellular Agriculture. This right. is the first research center anywhere in the world dedicated to cell-based meat. Wow. We also are working with uh, CCMB, Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology in Hyderabad. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a group of organizations working together there, Humane Society International India, ourselves, CCMB. Uh, we're doing some great work with them in terms of investigating different types of cells. So we're working with sheep cells there or they are working with sheep cells there uh, and we're going to be bringing in international expertise to see how they can grow it using certain parameters, certain protocols, help it grow faster, mm-hmm. bring more products into the, into the fold of cell-based meat. On that note, I think we're going to take a quick break, come back and talk some more. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another awesome week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please make sure that you do. We're IVM Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Please, please do. With the upcoming election season just around the corner, in case you really wanted to deep dive into some of the issues that matter, you should check out some of the shows on our network. Shows like Ganatantra, The Seen and the Unseen, The Prakati Podcast, Pulea Bazi, and even How to Citizen look into some of the issues that really do matter. This week on Cyrus Says, Cyrus is joined by Tripti Khamkar. Tripti talks about how she got into acting from a young age, convincing her family, discovering her comedic talent, and her very own podcast, Gold Kappa. On Shunya One, Varun Deshpande from the Good Food Institute joins us to talk about the Good Food Institute and the work that they're doing. On Thalde Harate, our Kannada podcast, Pawan and Surya discuss the Indian judiciary and all that we need to know about its citizens. On Pesa Vesa, Anupam hosts an hour-long special with Anil Gilani, head of passive investments at DSP Mutual Fund, and Mukesh Agarwal, CEO of NSE Indices, India's largest index and index service provider. This week, look out for the 50th episode of the Habit Coach podcast. Host Ashton Doctor is joined by a special guest on this one. And with that, let's continue with your show. All right, welcome back. What's the kind of, I mean, from a skill set point of view, I know it's, it's after all, you mentioned these organizations, obviously these are all chemical and bio, uh, you know, molecular biology folks. What's the uh, key, I would say, kind of people who are really working on this and in, especially the, in the startup space, right? I mean, do you really see, this is food tech. Yeah. In this reality, is tech, yeah. yeah, this is not the, this is not the food tech of, like I said, the the apps in this space, right? Yeah. This is actually interesting way. It's creating food. So, yeah. do you see that kind of interest at the startup level, or is it still in the realm of like a highly capital intensive sort of uh, business? And if you have seen some interesting startups, can you name some that are running out of India? Yeah, absolutely. Firstly, there's there's many rabbit holes that I could that I could jump down. <laughs> Super interesting stuff on this podcast, right? So like I've heard you talk about food tech before and I totally agree with you that I think companies like Swiggy, Zomato, they're doing amazing work. They're actually changing the way that consumer behavior is, right? Just like Netflix, just like Tinder, all these companies. I think that what I would want to define as food tech though is applying science and technology to food, okay. right? And changing formulations and things like that. So the, I, that, that's the definition that I use for food tech. Within India, there are a few companies that are doing some great work both in plant-based meat as well as early explorations in cell-based meat. So there's a company in Udaipur called Good Dot. Uh, we helped them get launched way back when, even before I was hired. And they're doing uh, vegetarian meat, uh, which is a mutton analog. Okay. Uh, they're doing really well. So they, you know, they've had articles in the Economic Times. You can look them up. They're currently raising a round of funding. They're, they're doing pretty well, right? 
There's also an early stage startup called Clear Meat, which is looking to do cell based chicken. Oh. So there, you know, things are happening on both ends of the spectrum. To answer your question about talent pool that would look at this, with cell based meat, what's really interesting is that there's a ton of research, a ton of um, investment that's gone into the biotech sphere that is directly translatable or translational into this area, right? So if you look at some of the people that have done this globally, the first cell based meat company was set up in 2016 or 2015. It was called Memphis Meats. Mm -hmm. It's actually set up by a cardiologist from Vijayawada in India. Oh, really? oh, okay. Yeah, so he moved to the US. His name is Dr. Uma Valetti, and he's a Mayo Clinic trained cardiologist. Hmm. And he realized that, you know, he can scale his impact only so much when it comes to being a doctor. Right. And this is the thinking with which I totally align, by the way. If he did this, he could have a greater impact on the world for all these various reasons, right? Hmm. So he started this company called Memphis Meats. Okay. And in 2016, they did the first ever cell based meatball. Wow. Oh, okay. Right. Then they raised a round of funding from Bill Gates, Richard Branson, crucially Cargill, which is one of the world's yeah, biggest yeah, food yeah, companies. Yeah, yeah. They've also raised money from Tyson Foods, mm. one of uh, the you chicken know, company. Yes, yes. America's biggest meat producer by far, mm. the world's second biggest meat company. So, you know, you can have cardiologists in this sector. You can have people who are coming in from biopharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. people who've done work in cell based therapeutics in all of these various areas can apply their expertise here. And that's part of why we exist. You know, we host conferences, we work with all of these scientists. We're trying to get really smart people that can apply their skills to this really huge problem. Hmm. And that's, that's the kind of talent that we need. When it comes to plant-based meat, the talent that's required is food science, food technology, chefs, people who can think of really interesting ways to iterate in food innovation. So you know how, when you're trying to create a food product, one of the challenges that you have is you create it, it's done, you put it out. It's like stochastic calculus, right? Like, I mean, stochastic mathematics. You can't, there's nothing you can do supposedly beyond putting it out because you've chosen the packaging, you've got yeah. the permissions, you've set up your line of manufacturing, you've done all of that stuff. Yeah. My personal feeling on this is that really smart people getting into food in general, but especially our sector, should be looking to create iterative loops as yeah. much as possible. So you asked a question about what's new and what's happening in the sector. One of the really great frontiers of technology in plant-based meats is new sources of protein. Mm -hmm. So globally, we've been using, you know, wheat, soya, pea mm -hmm. protein. It's the usual suspects. Corn, that I could, or no. Okay. Mycoprotein, which, right. is, which is mushroom fungus. There, there are a few things that have been used globally, right? You could count them on the fingers of both hands. Right. I remember soya. Uh, I remember like all kinds of uh, substitute mock meats yeah, that were made with soya. Yeah, that's been the first thing that... Yeah. We've all had Nutrella growing Nutrella. up. Nutrella. Well, uh, it wasn't really mock meat, but well, <laughs> it was how you trick uh, people as a kid. Into, into eating that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're right. And we think of this as like a whole generation removed from that, right? right? So yeah. that is that is mock meat or that's like even one generation before mock meat. And this is plant-based meat, which is right. just meat made from plants. Right. So, you know, we want this to be a simple switch, not a substitute. Right. And it seems that these companies are achieving that in some way, right? With respect to the different novel sources of protein, a lot of people are super excited about the idea of indigenous crops in places like India. Mm -hmm. So beyond just wheat, soya, you know, potato protein, pea protein, can we look at things like millets? Mm. Can we look at things like, of course, jackfruit? Mm. Can we look at all of these indigenous crops like sorghum, mm. right? Should we be doing work to expand or diversify the raw materials into the global sector? Mm. Correct. And that's something that India has a ton of potential in right here, right now. So even though I say Indians are not eating a lot of meat right now, there's a huge opportunity here on the ground to work as a sourcing mechanism or compete mm. for global supply chains in terms of talent and in terms of raw materials, which is huge. So if you look at Canada, the Canadian prairie provinces, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, you have politicians, governors there saying that they want to supply the world's requ requirements for pea protein. Right. I mean, I, I think we should be competing for things like that. Right? Mm. Any self-respecting Indian would say the same. Yeah. We have such a strong tradition of agriculture in this country. We have huge potential in terms of pulses, in terms of millets. We have great research institutes that are doing fantastic work to sequence all of this. Mm. Find out which pulses or which lines of which pulses, which, which seeds yeah, of which pulses genetically, yeah. are going to would lead be, to yeah. good, good outcomes. Yeah. Best use for what, you know, what end purpose, best protein content. Uh, can we ameliorate the protein content by adding amino acids? There's a lot of things that we can do that would really affect uh, the end product and have a huge role to play in this sector moving forward. Practically also, right? Uh, like I was asking, what 
kind of when do you get out when you actually want to go to market with something like this and suppose post research phase uh, if you actually go about manufacturing or even in a small scale trying to roll this out right how does it how do you make it go from that lab to you know actual productization and what's the what's the kind of startups again in this space trying to, how do they cross that bridge because it's not a typical is it like any other agri tech for uh, product like i mean I, there are a few folks who are trying to always uh, trying to do agri tech that's also a sector which is mm-hmm. fairly hot in india right now so how what's how capital intensive is it how how do you actually go about it yeah that's a great question and so i'll you know what i was talking about earlier with respect to iterative loops some of that should also include touching customers right so you should be looking just as with any food product you should be looking to do focus groups constantly you should perhaps be partnering with restaurants for small scale experimentation exactly as a as an entrepreneur in this sector it's food it is so personal it's so cultural um there's room for everyone but also you want to be touching customers early and often right, right? so that's what i would recommend to any entrepreneur when it comes to capital intensiveness cell based meat is obviously a little bit upstream in terms of uh, where you want to be uh, in terms of being able to touch consumers uh, with plant based meat there's definitely an opportunity to start something relatively cheaply what we would do over the next months and what we do uh, all over the world is focus on partnering with universities partnering with large companies to set up experimentation facilities mm-hmm. set up um these extrusion facilities where you can go in as an entrepreneur and try and get some samples and try and uh, iterate with your product and your different formulations and then help consumers to taste it and see how they feel about it right we would also be working with um you know international companies that might want to come to india uh, and you know local entrepreneurs who want to help them distribute that's certainly an avenue as well going about you know actually going to market with this just to follow on on that right especially since food is fairly regulated also as a industry i mean uh, we've seen a lot of products launch which are new in the food space like we also we have a lot of direct to consumer brands now uh, who have launched uh, you know but they in as startups and now of course they have even technically yes. like uh, lot of uh, right? uh, and they have vc investment yeah. also right so it's not unheard of that you can come in into the food space and actually innovate and create something but given this is a whole new sector what's the licensing and regulatory framework around this and obviously i'm assuming you guys have a role to play in that yeah absolutely i mean so organizations like the food safety and standards authority of india are really well capable i think of regulating this sector or giving it a regulatory path to market this is borne out by some of the progress that's been happening in the us with the us fda the us department of agriculture as well joining hands to regulate cell based meat mm-hmm. um they have essentially said that they have all the capability in house to give it a path to market and they're probably going to put something out during this year in india itself also like uh, will we have a fsi like standard for it so that would be in the us but you know if i had to tell you just from first principles off the top of my head what we believe should happen in sectors like this or in this in the cell based meat sector let's say generally you want a an entity that's responsible for it right so someone right. should be designated as being responsible for it in india it's very likely to be the food safety and standards authority of india or fsi as you call right. it uh we also want any requirements to be communicated very clearly right so this is india so obviously uh you know we'd want to understand what are the safety implications if someone's importing then it would be subject to all of those regulations packaging regulations all of that stuff should be conveyed very clearly and if there are any checks they should be conveyed very clearly as well right if there's any reporting required for that and then lastly the regulation itself should not be so onerous as to disadvantage what's correct. coming out in the marketplace correct level playing field is what is what we think makes the most sense because that's what gives consumers the choices that they need and want exactly but On do the, you think sorry. that there would be an issue around the fact that uh, there are there is a lot of uh, there are a lot of vested interests right okay, in, in the food industry itself right so will there be uh, will that be part of the challenge i mean like you know these indu- these interests basically protecting themselves what's been super encouraging about this sector both plant based and cell based meat internationally is that the the people who are pushing it forward the most are in fact the largest meat companies and the largest food companies mm. so if you look in the us tyson foods as i said which is america's largest meat producer second largest in the world they have this year started their own plant based meat line they've invested in plant based meats they've made two investments in cell based meat companies equally you know in canada maple food maple leaf foods which is canada's largest meat producer mm. has acquired 
Field Roast, which is a plant-based meat company. Same thing in Europe. Uh, same thing in other places. So we strongly believe that this is a journey that can take that, that can take place in India as well. It, it would make sense, right? Given that it's even, it's eventually uh, making their supply chain more efficient, like you said. It's they are growing the crops, but they would want to own the they might would as own well the supply, right? Might yeah. as well just cut off that middle process of the animal <laughs> yeah. and just make a. Burger. Right. As it's is this the most funny episode ever? You're talking about cutting off animals. He's talking about meeting of the minds. This is just the most funny episode I think we are. That's had. right. Yeah. We, essentially, what's happening is they're cutting out the middle animal. Right. Yeah. That, that's basically what's happening here. And yeah. you know, people very high up in Tyson Foods, including global CEO, have come out and said we want to, we want to be rebranding as a as a protein company, not just a meat company. Right. right. They've also said things like we want to actively disrupt ourselves. We don't want to. We don't want to be the ones being disrupted. All our conversations with large food producers in India have been very encouraging as well. Okay. So everyone in India is monitoring the global landscape, right? Including the largest food producers. Mm. We want to be offering them alternatives that create new lines of business for them as well. Right. And that this just makes complete sense to them. Whether it's investing in startups, whether it's doing this themselves, if they want to own the brand on meat, and the brand of meat is shifting, they're going to want to be a part of that future. I think. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. So, uh, one thing that we haven't really touched on, right, is uh, the moral case around this, right? And uh, the idea that uh, there will come a tipping point at which point it will become, it will be seen as barbaric to be eating meat anymore. How fast do you see something like that happening? 30 years? I think so. Yeah. I mean, we exist to accelerate that future, but I think that more importantly, I think we should be taking morality off the plate. Mm-hmm. Like I said, we need to meet people where they are. Uh, in philosophy, you'd call this a super erogatory choice, which is a moral choice. We need to turn it into an erogatory choice, which is a basic choice. Okay. Right? Let's just take morality off the plate. Mm-hmm. So, Although it's a good driver, I mean, but you're saying it should be a much simpler decision? Yeah, I mean, people are choosing, let's say, the, the impossible burger. And I keep mm-hmm. coming back to these companies because they're growing so quickly. Uh, the impossible burger is being eaten because it's a delicious product. And then it just happens to be better for the environment and all these things, right? right? So as a scientist, as an entrepreneur, as someone in government, as someone in a large foundation, you should be looking at this sector and thinking, this is a way of achieving my moral and professional goals. Mm. However, as a consumer, you should be eating this stuff because it's delicious. Right. And that's what we think will happen in a place like India as well. So like I said, as meat consumption and meat demand continues to rise in India... We hope to be able to plug that demand over the next decades with right. things that are tasty and nutritious and they just happen to be better for the environment right. I mean, and for all these reasons. We are, I mean, we are in the midst of a little bit of a organic revolution. Mm-hmm. There's a farm to fork revolution. The, these are all food tech buzzwords. Uh, but, you know, for people who get it and they, real, yeah. for people who are rather for people who think that is their decision making uh, you know angle mm. they choose it maybe consciously right I, I know people that's how all these brands are also advertising they're advertising you know healthy they're advertising organic they're advertising uh, cutting out the supply, middleman and the farmer is benefited and these stories are all there and hopefully true also mm. uh, so <laughs> given that uh, I'm sure there will be an angle to play here when these products come to market but you're right eventually it should settle as this is just I like this brand or flavor better and hence I use it I choose it it's like I mean to be honest it's literally going to end up like a Coke and Pepsi (laughs) there is no difference yeah (laughs) or there is maybe who knows yeah you know I want to address something you said earlier with respect to like how to position all of these Mm. products I, I think that it makes a lot of sense to be doing consumer research in these areas, right? So we'll be doing a lot of consumer research about like, should there be, should companies and startups putting out, let's say a plant-based protein food or plant-based meat product, should they be highlighting the protein content in it? Should they be highlighting, you know, no cholesterol, no trans fats, no antibiotic? Should they be talking about fiber? What should they be talking about? Because these things are sort of well-known in the States and in other places, And positioning is super, super important to any category, especially if it's a new category, right? So these are things that entrepreneurs have questions with. And, you know, we're happy to partner with any of them, with VCs as well, who are looking to get answers to these questions. So I I just want to kind of circle back a little bit to the the morality of this, right? And again, I know that I I understand what you're saying, right? I think that there is a a necessity that the 
the taste and what you're talking uh, as you mentioned the taste and the texture and that right that has to be on par yeah. right without that the moral case does not work but if you have the option between choosing either or and if they taste the same then would you why would somebody not pick the uh, the uh, the vegetarian piece at that point right yeah you're absolutely right i think so this is one of those things where you you mentioned that there'll be a point at which people will look back on this system and wonder how we allowed it to persist for as long mm-hmm. as we did i totally agree with that and i think that um if we give people what they want they will choose it because they have the option mm-hmm. but right now people are eating meat in spite of the way it's produced not because of it yeah. right. you know there's a very small proportion of uh, of of meat that's made in a certain way so you know wagyu beef where the cows are massaged and stuff like that where people are they take pride in that kind of stuff and they and they want to eat that kind of stuff right and there's i you know i mean i don't i'm not going to judge that i don't i don't think there's anything wrong with that with the way the world is currently right. structured but i think we can break out of these systems yeah. and i think we can build something that's completely new and in fact there's a company called just uh which does both plant based foods as well as is working on cell based meat mm-hmm. they've partnered with a wagyu beef farm in japan okay. i think it's called toga rashi farm to make cell based wagyu beef so you wow. have the cells of the cow that was massaged and had like <laughs> a really you know one of those like lugs lives uh which could not actually feed the world because those that's such a tiny proportion of farming actually right right uh, but you could take those cells and you could make wagyu beef from them and that's, then you could give wag, wagyu beef to everyone like right? you could drop yeah, the price of that's it that's interesting actually you remove all scarcity from everything right ostrich meat for everybody yeah, i mean like all of it right <laughs> sure see, i hear it's very local cholesterol so <laughs> <laughs> see the whole point i actually agree that in the end it's going to be about the things which people choose food for hmm. they I mean I may think it's organic but it may just makes me feel good right, right. that hey, I chose See, this and organic, hopefully it tastes well. If organic food sucked nobody would eat it. Exactly. Right? Organic food has to be on par with normal food. Exactly. Right? And preferably even better. Exactly. But and the same thing I think would apply over here. The 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 taste and texture has to be on par. Exactly. Exactly. And price and convenience and all of those yeah. things they all have to they have to tick those boxes and then how does it impact on price in the long run i i mean like again if you're talking about not having ma- the entire yeah, supply ex- chain around animal uh, slaughter doesn't the price in the long run go become a lot cheaper that's yeah. the idea yeah. yeah so this is true of plant based protein on its face right mm. it's also true of cell based protein in the medium term so you know the first cell based burger was eaten live on tv by the guy who made it, it was a dr mark post in the netherlands mm. and the project was funded by sergey brin of google and the netherlands government and it cost in r&d it cost 330000 dollars okay so obviously it's an r&d project he made this lamb burger and he ate it live on tv <laughs> now the same guy dr mark post he has a company called mosa meat which uh, apparently has a cost basis for the same burgers of about 10 to 12 dollars okay so you know as soon as any of these companies are allowed to launch into the market in a certain market whether it's the US whether it's Singapore whether it's India they're all going to rush into that market and competition is going to drive down the price even more yeah right and that that's what accelerates us towards that future where right. you know 30 years from now where you know all meat is plant based or it's cell based and we're looking back on a on a factory farming system that's been transcended and a lot of the you know may, many of the same players will still have primacy then right so tyson foods could still be up there then and uh, if they are up there then it's because they're making these bets now hmm. yeah. it, it's actually you know I mean like based on what you're saying it seems like it's possible that this future can come just on the basis of pricing yeah pretty you much know, i mean like uh, uh, it, it it seems like that seems like it's a yeah you know, meat's expensive right especially in a country like india meat yeah. is expensive if it's possible to kind of uh, have the kind of protein intake at the cost that you're having vegetables at I think that wow, that, I cannot believe we might be having beef here <laughs> just because it's made from ragi <laughs> or something like that. But that's an interesting future to look forward to. Thank you so much for I mean sharing this with us. I would I, I how do people get in touch with you? Uh what's the place to reach out to you uh, directly or the institute? Yeah, you can take a look at our website. It's www.gfi.org, the Good Food Institute. org, uh, and uh, my name is Varun Deshpande. So my email is Varun D at gfi. org. We would love to be talking to anyone, you know, scientists, entrepreneurs, people who want to invest in the sector, uh, people who work at foundations that are interested in the sector. This is a great way. to really do a lot of good in the world as well as do really well for yourself right in the coming years so that that's something that 
we're really excited about interacting with people in the Indian ecosystem and building that up together. Awesome. awesome. Just a reminder to everybody, please do sign up for the Slack channel. If you go to ivmpodcast.com slash junior one, there's a button over there and our new producer on this show, Avinit, will send you an invitation to join the Slack channel. Also, please do do a rating or a review wherever you can. If it's on iTunes, that'd be great. Otherwise, wherever you are listening to this, that would also be fine. Absolutely, and let's hope for uh, let's hope to meet you in the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you But, can find me on the Slack channel as well. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah ask Varun some questions on the Slack channel. He'll be happy to answer. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Our pleasure. Hi, my name is Anupam Gupta. I'm B50 on Twitter. I am the host of Pesa Pesa, the show that talks money. On my show, I speak to experts from every field of money and finance, from stock markets, equities, debt funds, credit cards, life insurance, every possible area of money and finance that you can think of. We even did an episode on cryptocurrency. I've got fantastic guests from mutual funds to personal finance experts everywhere. Robo advisory startups, just name it, we've got it. At Pesa Pesa, we help you make smart decisions about money. You work hard for money. Now make your money work hard for you. New episodes out every Monday and you can listen to my show on the IVM podcast app or any other podcasting app that you have. Pesa Vesa is brought to you by Paytm Money. How aware do you think you are of your laws and rights? Do you look up to laws when you are caught up in situations? Do you know what your rights are when you're stuck somewhere bad? Well, here's a show that can help you move an inch closer to being aware of what your rights are tune into know your kanoon with me amar rana this is a podcast meant to answer all your law related queries catch know your kanoon every week on the ivm website or the app or anywhere you get your podcast from